Welcome back, guys, to another episode here of MJSL. Uh, it's been a while since I've uploaded a video or even made a video or really even thought about making a video. Um, I explained to a few people that I just kind of got tired of making negative videos and really the league hasn't given me anything um, positive to say. Uh, I'm not going to say it's all bad, but nothing really to make, you know, a video about. Um, but there's been a lot of happenings this week uh, in the box group and certain protocol releases and just general opinions and predictions that I wanted to get out. So figured I'd start this video off, got my notes here, uh, I'm just going to kind of go through semi-chronologically with the In the Box show. Uh, it was almost four hours, so that's a lot to cover. Uh, so I just went through and picked the things that I really had an opinion about. And, you know, we'll go from there. Uh, at the end, got a couple more strong predictions to make. Um, a couple random opinions of what I think the league should focus on and do. But, uh, We'll just start off and we'll go for there. Uh, this might turn into a bit of a long one. So the first thing I want to cover is the goalkeeper rule. Um, I, I haven't met anyone or talked to anyone yet that's as okay with it as I am. Uh, I'm not a player. I don't really understand the depths of the game that much. I'm just glad that... The ball's not getting passed back to the goalkeeper six times a possession because uh, that's one thing that really drove me up a wall first couple of years as a fan was just pass it to this guy, back to the goalkeeper, pass it to this guy, back to the goalkeeper, pass it to this guy again, back to the goalkeeper, pass it to this guy, cross the half line. Oh, I don't like that. Pass it back to the goalkeeper. Um, that was an aspect of the game I really didn't like, so the goalkeeper rule I'm okay with. Um, I can understand why people like it, so I guess I just got to accept the fact that I'm part of the minority that either doesn't care about the new goalkeeper rule or, you know, uh, or enjoys it. Um, let's see. And I pretty much got the goalkeeper rule covered with that statement, so we'll move on to page two. This is going to be sloppy. I just threw notes together as I watched the guys show. So forgive me for my poor production quality. Uh, the attendance. The attendance is down. Um, but something I also want to talk about is the views. You would think if the attendance was down, the YouTube views would be up. But the YouTube views aren't up. They're down as well. Um, when you're watching a game, and I'll just explain it how it works on my TV. If I'm watching the game and I've got my Amazon Fire Stick, if I push up, it goes to like a menu screen. Um, and it will show me how many people are viewing with me, or I should say how many devices are viewing. And those numbers are pretty low. Um, from what I've watched, I'm going to say probably an average of about 700 devices viewing. Uh, I haven't seen it any higher than 1,100. I could be wrong. It could have gotten above 1,100. But while it's going on live, you can look and see how many people or how many other devices are viewing it with you. And with COVID and lack of attendance, you would expect that number to be way up there. But I mean, 700 devices in an international league, there's there's not a lot of people um, viewing that. So we did lose a lot of the fan base with the COVID years or possibly some other decisions. Um, so yes, COVID is obviously keeping attendance down in venues across the world. Um, but like I said, the YouTube viewership isn't way up here to compensate for that because if you're still a fan and you don't want to go to the arena well you're going to sit at home and watch it so i don't know um someone wants to take a stab at that one and guess why the numbers are so low 
by all means have at it, but the attendance is down, the viewership is down, the fan base is down from what I see. Um, so, uh, the player safety. Uh, the player safety issue obviously is important. Um, I'm not going to cover, like, I'm not going to try and defend, like, blatant fouls and refs allowing games to continue when guys are down on the turf. But in the end, I have to ask, like, when do we bring out, you know, headgear or more pads or, I mean, even when NFL football started, they didn't wear helmets back then. Um, and then they went to like this leather padded cap. And now, obviously, if you watch the NFL at all, you know, they're in full helmets with face masks and uh, of that sort. And that's all based on player safety. Uh, Max Ferdinand wears a little headgear. A lot of people just think it's a headband, but it's actually, you know, a padded protectant of his head um, because he's had too many head injuries in his career. So, yes, it's unfortunate what happened to Vanzilla there in that game. Uh, a knee to the head and being knocked out like that is never pretty. Uh, I do wish him the best, but had he had a helmet and a face mask on, would he be out tonight's game? Because um, I'm filming this on Saturday night. Hopefully I'll get it uploaded around midnight. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when instead of, I guess the point I'm trying to make with that one is, you know, instead of going backwards and making the game more boring, when are you actually going to protect the players with equipment? A good example is the NFL. I think they really overprotect the quarterback now where you, you can hardly breathe on them without drawing a 15-yard penalty. And I've gotten used to it, but it has taken away from the game that I grew up with. Um, and I think there's a danger of the MASL going that route with all the player safety protocols and all the player safety this. It, you're going to... I mean, say Vanzilla didn't take that knee to his head and the player that was there, I don't remember that gentleman's name, but that could have been a really awesome toe kick or steal or, you know, he could have gotten around him and scored a goal. It could have been really awesome. Unfortunately, it went the way that it did. Um, but the point I'm making is you could have taken away from what could have been a really awesome scoring steal or play or however you want to look at it. But that's accidentally going to happen, you know, and he was, you know, suspended or whatever, or penalized after the fact. But, I mean, just for overall safety, I think it might be time to look into, you know, possibly some type of padded headgear or, you know, pads on the body or something of that sort. To protect these guys. And obviously that's really easy for me to say as a fan. Like I'm not out there getting hurt. I'm not out there running up and down. Uh, so yeah, it is really easy for me to sit back and say those things. But yeah, that's what I'd like to see. Um, I'd like to see more protection with PPE versus, you know, rule changes that tame the game down. Uh, I guess more hockey and less soccer, <laughs> uh, just to add to the excitement. I don't know. Um, Going to continue on from that one. Uh, the referees. Um, and I'm going to make a point to this, um, and I don't remember exactly what was said verbatim on the In the Box show, but, you know, I do see a point where the head referee is like, you get what you pay for. And it's not about going in there and giving it your all regardless of the pay. Um, I mean, you should really give the effort of what your pay scale reflects. Um, I've had this conversation with my boss, and I understand it goes over really, really bad with a lot of people, but, you know, they kind of understood it's a family-owned business, but, you know, they know they're paying a little bit below scale, and, you know, so I pretty much told him, like, you know, if I'm caught up and you see me on my phone, don't give me a hard time. I might be checking something or, you know, if my job's done, cool. Like, you're not paying me a whole lot to 
find make work to keep me busy because I'm not allowed to leave till 4.30 regardless of what's done and what's not. And, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, a good example is uh, an argument I used to have, or not an argument, but a statement I used to make back in the day when the whole, oh, McDonald's workers don't deserve $15 an hour because they get our orders wrong and the service is poor and the workers have attitude problems. Well, yeah, you'd have an attitude problem too and do a bad job if you worked 40 hours a week, smelled like a French fryer, and you still had money problems at the end of the day. Um, you pay somebody 15 bucks an hour to do that. Now you're going to bring in other people that are willing to do a better job for that better amount of money. And you would see service improve. You would see attitudes improve. You would see a better job getting done. Um, so with the whole pay scale, again... Like it's, you do get what you pay for. And if the refs aren't getting paid a whole lot, then the guys that are really good at it aren't going to do it because they're not getting paid enough. And you're going to be stuck with the people that are just willing to do it for the pay that's being offered. Um, there's really no argument there. It's the old, you know, ancient cliche of you get what you pay for. And the refereeing I see right now is maybe the referee budget does need to go up a little more. I don't follow it really that far in, you know, I'm not going to call out the head ref or anything. I did like Adam's ideas of, you know, get fresh blood in there um, and see what happens. But, I mean, if you're not paying them a good amount of money, why should they do a better job? Um, the next I want to cover is the social media and the interactions with the fans and the social media is very, well, I have the word abysmal written down. I wouldn't say it's abysmal because it has gotten better, um, but it, it's still pretty poor. Uh, a good example I want to use is I hopped on the Milwaukee Brewers uh, Facebook page today. Now, they're averaging two to three posts per day. It's January. There is no baseball. There's a current lockout right now. There may not be a spring training. But the Milwaukee Brewers are posting three times a day to their fan base and interacting with them and keeping it going. Um, which is more than what we're getting out of the MASL in the middle of the MASL season. I and mean, there, there's just so many things, you know, it's, even if you have no news to report, give us a little quip, give us a little, you know, on this day in history, or today is this person's birthday, or on, you know, this day this team was founded by such and such, or whatever, you know, just give us something where we want to interact, we want to hear news, we want to see news. And I like Adam's idea in the show where it's like, give us a monthly newsletter of what you're working on. Like, what's going on? What's happening? What are you doing? What's taking so long? How far along are you on certain investigations about games I'm going to cover here in a couple more pages? Um, stuff like that. It just give us something. Um, so yeah, the social media really hasn't gotten a whole lot better. But it, we really got to take it, you know, with a grain of salt, I guess, that we did see a little bit of an improvement on that. But we're really, I'd say, you know, really only 40% of the way we where we should be um, as far as social media and interactions with the fan base goes. Uh, moving right along, because I do have nine pages on this little notebook here. Uh, moving right along, the college draft. Um, <laughs> Knee-jerk reaction, it's pretty dumb. Um, you have open tryouts, so again, college draft, I don't, I, I don't get. Like, I really want to see this first college graph, or draft, excuse me. 
Because I want to see how many players just say no when they're drafted. Like, oh, in the first round, uh, Chihuahua, because they're going to finish last, I'm going to assume the draft works like any other sport where the worst team gets the first pick. Um, so in the first round, you know, Chihuahua picks Joe Smith from, you know, Colorado. And he's going to be paid 500 pesos a game you know, to, to play or whatever, you know, I don't know the money currency. I'm just spouting this out and just have the guy be like, no, <laughs> I, I make more with my college education and I'm not going to risk injury for such a low scale of pay. Like just no, like no. So I think that one's going to be pretty interesting. I could be wrong. Um, my predictions I'd like to believe are about 50, 50 because some of mine are just knee jerk, stupid, predictions and other ones I do put some thought into uh, this one I put a little bit of thought into so I just I don't see how it could possibly work um, I know of very few players that are probably paid enough to not work another job um, so yeah I just don't see the college draft unless they're trying to use the college draft to appear more professional to the government authorities to make visas easier like instead of the open tryouts maybe maybe that's some roundabout way of looking at it like maybe they're trying to get away from that and focus more on college tryouts and that'll make them look more professional but as far as just a, a college draft I really don't see how that benefits anybody because any college player that wants to play can just walk to the tryouts and try out. And I mean, that's, and I'm not even sure if there is collegiate indoor soccer really. So are you just going to assume because they're an amazing outdoor player that they're going to come in and understand, you know, the indoor rules and, you know, just cross over. Like, I, I think they're a little different, but I mean, again, Time will tell on that one. I'm interested in seeing the first one, whether it be actually effective or the comedy show that I personally think it's going to be. Ah, going on to page four here. We're almost halfway through. Um, okay, now it the Baltimore games. I, I don't know how to say this or how to go into it. Uh, the two Baltimore games that didn't happen... Two months ago now, um, we've gotten two posts on social media that there's a investigation going on and no decision has been made. One, what's taking so long? Two, what's to investigate? Like a team did not produce a team or field a team and wanted those games postponed because they as I see it, blatantly refuse to use backup players to fulfill a schedule. Um, again, I'm not part of this investigation. That's how I see it. That's my opinion, and I'm standing by it. Like, Baltimore just flat out didn't field a team. Um, I understand the Milwaukee Wave is trying to recuperate a pretty hefty sum of money uh, over their game. I don't know what Kansas City is doing. As a fan, I just want to know what the results of those games are. Like, why can't you give us that? Like, from our team, we've already been refunded those tickets or exchanged those tickets. As far as, as, far as my ownership is telling me, that game is not ever going to happen. So let's go ahead and either make them the forfeits they are or let's see if they're rescheduled or... I mean, two months, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, it like, really, I'm not, I'm not talking bad about the guy, but when something this serious is going on with missed games, maybe youth futsal in Spain probably isn't in the best interest of the league for the commissioner to participate in. Um, off season. Sure. We're smack dab in the middle of the season with some controversy going on. And, we're 
I don't feel we're getting the results we should. And really, in my eyes, that's just a conflict of interest. And like, <laughs> really, yeah. So as far as Baltimore, give us, give us what the results are. Like, are they forfeited? Are they postponed? What's the final decision? If you don't have a final decision, why the hell not? It's not that hard. Um, as far as, you know, the wave trying to recoup that money, I don't care about that. I feel bad about that. I don't want to see anyone lose money or whatever, but that's not what I'm concerned with. I want to know what the results of the game are so we can get the standing straight and everything is on the up and up as far as that goes. Um, next, I want to touch on the visa issues. And yes, there are a lot of visa issues in this league. Now, I'm going to share up here a screenshot of the definition of semi-professional. And really, yeah, you can call the MASL the top tier of indoor soccer worldwide, you know, the number one league number one professional league, but by the definition that's above my head, you'll see that the MASL is very much a semi-pro league. Uh, semi-pro, read it, it won't be verbatim because I'm just doing it off the top of my head, but I'll share the screenshot. It's a sport where a player is paid, but he is not paid enough for that to be his sole income. And we know that most of the players have day jobs and, <laughs> you know, other ventures and other ways of making money because, no, they're not making a living off of playing in the MASL. So by definition, the MASL is a semi-pro league. And anyone that knows me knows I have no love for the way our government does things. But I do kind of agree on why they're being treated this way, you know, as far as visa goes and why they're not being treated like a like a top level league when it comes to the players getting visas. Like it's, it's a semi pro league where they're most likely going to make a part timers wage. So as much as I disagree with a lot of the things our government does, I, I don't, I can see these visa issues continuing for years to come because it's, it's a semi pro league. So what do we do about that? I don't know. Like, I enjoy having the international players here. Um, obviously, it adds excitement to the game. It brings talent to the game. But if you can't get a visa for, you know, four of the guys you got on your team or three of the guys you got on your team, it, it doesn't do really any good to have them on the team. Like, it was great to see Chino play a little bit down in Chihuahua which I didn't watch a whole lot of those games. I'll get into that later. Um, but he hasn't spent any time with the team, and there's the two games we're going to see him all year because he's able to play in Mexico, but he's not able to play up here. So I guess to a certain extent, maybe I'm saying maybe we do need to stick locally until this league has grown and established and an actual professional league, and it makes the visas get easier and then we can grow from there. Um, but right now, I, I understand the visa problems, and I just personally don't see them going away no matter how many lawyers you have working on it or how many people are trying hard or how many people are trying to do this. It's a semi-pro league. Like, why are you coming to America to play semi-pro ball? They're going to pay me $200 a game. Again, I'm just throwing out random numbers. And I'm going to coach in the summertime, you know, doing this, this, and this, and, you know, you're, I don't want to say it's not productive, because I, I know it's productive, but from a government's eyes or standpoint, that's, that's not really productive, and the work visas are for things that are productive. Um, again, I don't agree with the fact that they're not productive, so don't bash me for that one, um, but I'm saying, I'm just saying that I can understand why, you know, the government is treating the league the way it is because the league is what it is. Uh, on to page five. I'm going to touch really briefly on the whole Keefe 
Tozer thing, uh, the Kamith. Um, I don't really see it as a mockery. It's the internet. The internet sucks. We're mean here. We're bu we bully here. There's going to be shit you see here that's offensive. You're going to see shit that offends you. You're going to see shit that offends your mom. You're going to, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, if someone made a mock page of, you know, me, I'd, I'd kind of be flattered because imitation is the best form of flattery. Um, so on that one, I, I think, you know, worrying about what Commissioner Tozer would think if he came into the group and saw that there was this weird Keith Tozer, you know, imitation page and he's going to get mad and blame the group for that, I... I think that's a little far-fetched. Um, if he does get upset, I don't see where that's anybody's problem but his own. Um, it's the internet. Like, it's filled with crap you don't like. So if it upsets you that bad, um, there's a little red X up in one of these corners on your computer screen. You click on that and it goes away forever. Um, so yeah, as far as the internet goes and mockery, like it, it's just something that's gonna happen and get used to it or get off the internet. Like that's, that's, that's how I feel about that one. Um, another thing I'm gonna touch on is Mr. Mike Zimmerman, uh, the owner of ROC Ventures, owner of the Milwaukee Wave, owner of the Milwaukee Milkmen, and Adam pretty much summed it up here. Uh, we've all had our run-ins with our beloved owner, and we've all made amends. Uh, I have not made amends with him in person, but I have made amends with him through Facebook messaging and all that. He, he is a harsh individual, and especially when you have strong personalities, you know, coming in contact with each other, they're bound to clash, and... I'm not going to make excuses for things he said or things he does online, but it's, again, it's the internet. Um, I, I'm known to tell racists and homophobes to drink bleach, um, so I really can't say anything bad about it because I don't think he's ever wished someone to go kill themselves, so I, I can't really look at the pot and call the kettle black. So that, that's where it is on that. Um, so again, that, uh, that's the same answer. It's the internet. If you don't like it, get off of it um, or block them or, you know, it, you, you can either deal with it or don't deal with it. But it's, it's something that I don't see is going to change. Um, I, agree with his, I agree with most of his opinions. I may not agree with the way that he states them, but I, you know, lately, uh, as I've been reading, I'm pretty much on board with everything, you know, he says uh, as far as things go. But, I mean, that's what I want to tap on there. Um, I understand it can be hurtful the first time it happens. Um, it wasn't a great feeling when he wanted to buy my season tickets back because I called his baseball team stupid. But we're past that. It's over. It, it is what it is. Um, move, you know, going on. Um, now we're going to get into the rules segment of the guy's show over there from this past Thursday. Now, the rules, I think Adam helped clarify a lot as far as the way they're worded. Uh, I think maybe the MASL should work on their press releases, make them a bit more easy to read, maybe put them in an order that makes sense, and maybe give examples of, you know, what the rule is in the actual press release, and people can actually read that. So as far as the celebration rules, um... Let the guys celebrate goals. There's only 15 guys on the roster. Who cares if they run out on the field? Like that's, I don't understand 
I, I think Geo chimed in with a comment that I think it's just to speed up the game. Um, I, I really don't see where that slows the game down because, like, in a wave game, you know, he scores the goal, he celebrates, then, it, you know, one of the staff come out, give him a ball to sign, and kick into the stands. And I think these players could run off the bench, celebrate, and then run back by the time that ball gets signed, kicked, and everything else goes on. So I really don't see where this could possibly speed up anything. Um, I know goals are scored a lot more often in the MASL, but like they stated in the show, like teams celebrate these things, like especially in outdoor soccer because most games end really far down in the single digits, like. Pretty sure, you know, a 5-2 to two outdoor soccer game is a pretty high-scoring affair. So, and 5-2 to two is pretty common, you know, that would be considered low-scoring in indoor. But, I mean, celebrations to, you know, ban players from the field to celebrate the goal, I just, I really don't see the point in that one. Um, but, yeah, that... There's not much more to say about that one. I just don't see the point. I don't see where it speeds things up by any means. And it just seems like a reason to find teams when they're not paying attention or someone scores a really sweet heel kick, back spin, bicycle goal. Like some of those goals are pretty epic and guys are going to run out on the field anyway. So what I did figure out is uh, I figure if we put tip jars throughout Panther Arena and we each drop 50 cents in there you know for you know just every time we walk by drop 50 cents in drop 50 cents in and that'll be our fine fund <laughs> uh, I kind of got this idea from uh, when Washington State originally did their smoking ban they didn't write out the fines it was just a hundred dollar fine and it never got worse. So the bars just put a tip jar out. And it was like, if you want to smoke in here, you got to throw five bucks in the jar. People would throw five bucks in the jar. The bar would get fined for allowing smoking. They'd take a hundred bucks out of the jar, pay the fine. Uh, that's been changed since then. But same thing. We'll just put jars around the arenas. Everybody throw a buck in every game or 50 cents or whatever you can afford. Something minimal. We all have, you know, loose change in our pocket. And the guys can celebrate, and we can we can pay the fine. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, the lights off rule, um, meh. I, it's the guys. I pretty much agree with the guys on in the box. Like, don't kill the lights altogether. People have to be able to see. Um, But I think, you know, like they had mentioned the, the Gordy and Chino thing at the end of the game, uh, not last year, maybe the year before. Yeah, the year before. And the lights weren't completely off. I mean, the lights were still, I mean, we went to our, I don't know if we were still on the purple lights or if we had gone to the yellow lights by then. But it... it the lights being off, that kind of stuff's going to happen. Um, so, again, pretty much agree with them where, yeah, player safety is an issue. People are running around celebrating. Maybe the lights should stay on or not go completely dark and stay bright enough to where people can actually still see where they're going. Um, the board's rule, again, meh. I, I don't think that affects us at all here in Milwaukee. Um, like, uh, Matt had mentioned there's a beer garden in Utica that they're going to have to push back four feet. So again, I don't know the incident that caused this rule to push people back four to six feet where there's not a permanent seat because in most of these arenas, there is going to be a permanent seat there and... Yeah, so just meh on that one doesn't really affect me at all. I'm in the 200 level behind glass, so again, it's a rule that doesn't affect me, so I really can't have an opinion on it. Uh, the two goalkeeper on the roster rule, again, duh, why wouldn't 
you do that. Like players get injured, so you're gonna have your goalkeeper go down and then put your sixth attacker out there for the whole rest of the game. And then, like, duh, two goalkeepers. Like, uh, seems pretty simple to me, but I'm not a coach. I'm not a player. I'm not really that involved. But again, I, I think it just makes sense. You know, two goalkeepers. You know, hockey players suit two goalies. I don't know what the outdoor soccer sport does, but yeah, two goalkeepers. That sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, the fighting of people for having negative opinions. Um, that's just over-policing. Uh, people are going to be critical of you in your position. Uh, you choose to be a referee, you're going to get called out on bad calls. Uh, you choose to be a player, you're going to get called out on bad plays. Uh, you choose to be a coach, you're going to get called out on bad coaching. Um, people just, <clears throat> as long as you're civil and you can have, you know, a certain way to express the negativity, you can't just fine people for posting on social media or saying something on the broadcast about a missed call or a poor job being done. Because, you know, I can see if it's derogatory. Like, that ref's an idiot. Okay, that's a little derogatory. Maybe give that guy a fine if he says that on air. But, oh, that ref just missed a call and he really shouldn't be missing calls that are that close to him, blah, 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 or however you want to word it. We'll see who gets fined first for this and what they get fined for, but people's opinions are people's opinions. And regardless of who you work for or what you do, you really should be able to, to state those opinions. Try not to cloud it out in here too much. Um, the arena and the field size, um, it really needs to be done. A standard needs to be set. Uh, I'm going to throw my idea out there. Um, we could allow for some fluctuation, but I don't think that fluctuation should be any more than 10 feet. Uh, 10 feet on the length, 5 feet on the width. Um, to go from a 200 by 85 in Milwaukee to a 150 by 85 in Baltimore, that is too much of a difference that changes the game. So unless you're going to have different rules on the Baltimore field to accommodate for um, you know, their lack of 50 feet on the field, uh, I'm not going to get into it if it's an actual 150 feet. We're just going to go with what the league says and call it 150 feet. Even if it was 150 feet, I feel it's way too small. Um, a good example would be the Waves first game in Baltimore. Um, that was a close game. And unfortunately, it was won by just brain-farted three-line violation after three-line violation after three-line violation because in any other arena, those kicks aren't three-line violations. But in Baltimore's little you know, toddler turf, it, it is. And that shouldn't be deciding games. Like, teams shouldn't be practicing over here, excuse me, and then playing a game over here. And they're like, man, we practiced that pass all week, and that's, you know, that wasn't a three-line violation in practice. Dang it, you know. So I, could, I feel the frustrations. I felt the frustrations that game. Shouldn't have something like that dividing it. As far as some of the venues, like, I'm going to agree with Adam and, you know, with his four. Um, I agree with him that Baltimore is at the top of those four, but there are four venues for different reasons that just simply shouldn't be in the league because it's not helping us look professional, which in turn is not helping with the visa issues, which in fact is not helping with the growth, which... I mean, it's just, like, 
hockey arenas are everywhere. Hockey is a very popular sport. It's the field size is there. Um, so yeah, we really, I like Adam's plan of, you know, we're going to implement this by, you know, 2027, everybody's going to be on a field that's at least this big. I think that's fair. Um, th there's, there's venues that are available. If one isn't available in the city you're in, move your team. <laughs> They're out there. So go find one. We just can't have barns, rec centers, overly small fields in the league. It, it just looks bad. Page number eight. We're almost done here. Uh, this is just a shout out to the Blast fans really quick. Just accept and admit that your venue's not up to snuff. Like, it's every time it's brought up, there's a little army of you that come to defend that little college shithole. Now, yes, it's pretty. Yes, it's newer. Yes, it's, you know, state of the art or whatever, however you want to call it. It's a basketball court that you try and put a field on. Like, there's no way a full-size field. It's not a viable venue for major arena soccer league. It's, it's just not. It's not. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that UW Panther Arena isn't a 70-year-old, very outdated venue whose replacement has already been torn down and replaced, but yet UW Panther Arena still stands there. I'm not going to jump into its defense. Yes, it's old. Yes, it's outdated. Yes, it should probably be torn down and redone with modern amenities and you know modern standards. There's some seats in that arena you can't even sit because a concrete wall is right there. So that's a seat that they put in that they can't even sell unless you're going to put a child in that seat that doesn't need the actual leg and foot space in front of them to use that, uh, to use that seat. So if I can admit that my arena is kind of shitty, I think it's time you guys just come to terms with the fact that Baltimore Blast does need a different venue, and the SECU arena on a college campus is not a long-term viable location for a major professional sports team. It's just not. So please, just admit that it sucks. We all know that it sucks. You're coming to its defense every time someone says it sucks isn't helping convince any of us that it doesn't suck. So just admit it and move on. A lot of us don't play in the greatest arenas, but we don't blindly try and defend the truth. Uh, now I'm going to touch on Chihuahua Savage. Um, I don't understand why it's so hard and why my prediction coming true is so shocking. They are an expansion team, an expansion team that's not even made up of its M2 championship players. Uh, they put together this all-star team, which is something I learned watching the show. Uh, so you got a handful of players from Sonora, you got a handful of players from Monterey, you got a handful of players from the original Chihuahua game or Chihuahua team. You've got a handful of players from the Barracudas, and they've made, like, this Mexican all-star team. Guys ever watch a Pro Bowl or an all-star game? They're, they're not very exciting because these players aren't coached together or played together for a while or melded together. So it, it's just a recipe kind of for disaster. Like, maybe in a few years of them playing together, they could be a viable team, but... You're not just going to throw together this motley crew of a all-star team and have them be successful. Like it just doesn't, I, I don't see where my prediction coming true on the Chihuahua Savage is so shocking. 
Like it, <laughs> they're they're not a good team. Another thing you could throw in there is, and I don't know how many players. I'm not going to try and guess how many players. I'm not going to be bothered to look up how many players. But it's my understanding a lot of their players have visa issues as well. So when Chihuahua travels to the United States to play all of its away games, because all of its away games are over the United States border, it's not even really the full Chihuahua Savage team because they've got several players that can't follow because of visa issues. So again... So the team is only full strength for half the season at home in their rec center. Like that's it, that's just not viable. That's you're not going to be a good team. Um, it makes sense that their only win is against my Milwaukee Wave team, which is kind of struggling. They're getting better, um, moving on. You know things happen, but yeah, it took a double header at home in your weird little rec center against a team that's not doing as great as it should be uh, to get your one win, to get your final first win of the season. Um, so if, you, if they do end up with any more wins, they are going to be at home when their team is at full strength. But again, yeah, you're not going to do good with that. Um, Another thing I was talking to a friend of mine about, and I'm not going to mention him by name because I don't want, you know, if he wants to say who he is, he can say who he is. But they, a lot of the Mexican players have already been cherry-picked by other teams. Um, you've got, you know, you got Chino in Milwaukee. You've got... Uh, ah, I'm brain farting right now, but... Every team has a player from Mexico, at least one on there. So these are players that the Savage can't pick up. So they've already cherry-picked the, the good players that are willing to play indoor soccer, and they're spread out throughout the league, you know, the ones that can get visas or whatever. So th those are also players that Chihuahua can't pick up, considering it's my understanding that that team is 100% uh, Mexican players. So, like, I'm not saying anything bad about any of the players. You know, they're all way better than my fat, you know, slow, out-of-shape ass. Like, obviously, they are decent soccer players, and I'm not going to say that they're not. Um, but I'm also not going to say that they're the best. <laughs> so it's, you know, that it's you're having to, to take players that wouldn't be anyone's necessary first choice uh, because those players are already gone on this team over here and this team over here and this team over here. So you're left with the, the talent pool that the other teams left you to pick from. Um, so yeah, we had that discussion uh, before a game. And yeah, so that's that's how I feel on that one is, is Chihuahua is just not, any expansion team is not going to do well the first year. So, uh, well, that pretty much wraps it up for the opinions I have on their show. Uh, I am going to get on to some statements I would like to make personally, just because I'm here and I'm known for my strong statements and bold predictions. So why don't we go ahead? Now, I'm going to stick with Chihuahua on this one and not necessarily Chihuahua, just uh, international in general. Um, I think the league needs to step back from that for a while. I think the league needs to get a strong foothold in the United States market, allow this team, you know, turn this league into a professional league where it would make visas easier and, you know, travel easier and all of those other things. So as much as I would love to see teams in Canada, teams in Mexico, you know, a team in Puerto Rico or, you know, along those lines, I would love to see that. I don't think the league's in a position for that right now. Um, so that kind of takes me on to bold prediction number one. Uh, I don't believe Chihuahua will be part of the league next year. Uh, and I'm basing this off of Mexican team history in the MASL. Uh, they might not be gone for good, but 
from what I've seen over the last few years, you know, Sonora's here and gone. Sonora's back again. Now they're gone again. Oh, let us give our our charter to Chihuahua so they can play in the league while we take another year off. Monterey's here. Monterey's not here. Monterey's back in it again. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments, but I'm pretty sure Monterey won the championship and then didn't play the next year in the league. So the, the reigning champion wasn't even part of the league that year. So I just, I just don't think the stability is there. Um, so I think until the league gets a foothold and has actual plans for how they're going to deal with the visas and how they're going to represent as an actual professional league, I, I, I just don't see... You know, these teams working out. Uh, the Metro Stars were one and done. Uh, the Mexican teams, like I had just stated, they're, they're very unstable. There's no continuity in a lot of this. Uh, Adam had mentioned that, you know, the league hasn't had the same lineup two years in a row in its entire existence, I believe. And I think we should really focus on, you know, the strong eight or 10 or 12, you know, get people like these are the standards. This is what we expect. This is what we're going to do. And uh, the teams that just simply refuse to meet that or can't meet that, well, you can go play in M2. Because um, the... The higher league to get that professional status, it needs to look professional, and it just doesn't yet. So that's my prediction as far as Chihuahua goes. I, I don't think they'll be part of the league next year. Again, they may be back following year, but I just I don't see them, you know, just being a viable option. And especially like what happens if Sonora wants their charter back to play in the league. Like, they're the ones that gave it to Chihuahua so they could play. So, I don't know. <laughs> uh, another bold prediction I'd like to make, and I'm not sure if you notice my scarf backdrop back here. This year, us Wave season ticket holders got a new season ticket holder scarf. So I had to take one down to make room for yet another wave scarf. And the one I took down is the Mesquite Outlaws. Uh, I don't think they'll be back either. They are listed on uh, MASL as an inactive team, but they were in one year, took COVID off, um, took the COVID year off. Now they're taking another year off. I, I just don't see them coming back. Uh, especially with the turnouts you're getting in Dallas right now for the sidekicks, like, because they're pretty much in the same area as far as big spread out, you know, DFW goes. So really they were pulling from one fan base to begin with. So I just, I don't see them returning. So there's bold prediction number two. Uh, I think the outlaws are done. Uh, maybe they'll prove me wrong. Maybe I'll be right again. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, I think that's about it. I think I've gone on long enough. I doubt there's a whole lot of people still watching at this point. So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, thanks for joining me. Hopefully I'll maybe make a video. But as of right now, I'm just really not all that motivated to, uh, to talk about things. Um, oh! Oh! something I didn't mention. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Let me, uh, <laughs> we're not going to wrap this up. Uh, one thing I think is really important for games and especially if you're going to do an international league with the United States and Mexico, um, every t every single game needs to have an English broadcast and a Spanish broadcast, period, period. It's, I'm not bilingual, and that's my own fault. Um, uno cerveza, por favor, is, as far as my Spanish goes, 
Um, and that's, again, that's my own fault, but I'm not alone. So I mentioned that I was going to get to the Chihuahua games and why I didn't watch a whole lot of them. I don't speak Spanish. They're completely unwatchable to me. Uh, anyone that follows my camping channel knows that when I go camping, I like to watch the Brewers game on Saturdays. Every camping trip, I watch the Brewers game on Saturdays. Uh, I'm winter camping now. So I was actually in the middle of the woods, winter camping, when we had those back-to-back -back Chihuahua games, and I really wanted to watch them, and I couldn't. I, could, I don't understand Spanish. And I'm sure there's fans in Mexico who... I'm sure their English is better than mine. I'd almost bet money on it, but I'm sure they'd rather, you know, they'd prefer their games be broadcast in Spanish. So every away game, how, you know, they're watching games in English because every game that happens in the United States is in English and every game that happens in Mexico is in Spanish. So while the Chihuahua fans are probably at the game, so they don't need the Spanish broadcast then, and the team they're playing is from America, and that fan base needs an English broadcast because I'm not the only stupid, dumb American that screwed up and didn't take Spanish in class. No, I took French, and I don't speak a lick of that either. Um, so, yeah, that, that really should be, you know, obvious. I mean, some of I see some Spanish broadcasts and English broadcasts every once in a while on a game, but every single game should have an English and a Spanish broadcast if you're going to try and do an international league. Um, but I guess that is kind of an offshoot of what I was saying where I think, you know, the, the league just needs to reel that back and set a foothold in the origin country before they try to expand. Um, but anyway, so now we'll go ahead and wrap it up. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. Uh, maybe if the guy's got anything interesting to say on next week's show that I agree with, disagree with, have an opinion on, maybe I'll make a video. We'll see. But until then, we'll see you next time.